Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Of course, in the M Health Summit, we would have a few technical difficulties, but we're, we're here and ready to roll. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our distinguished chair for this um, session, uh, Dr. Roderick Pettigrew, for this research track session that's entitled State of the Science and Research on Mobile Health Technologies. Dr. Pettigrew is the director of the National Institute of Biomedical In Imaging and Bioengineering at NIH. And prior to his appointment at NIH, he was professor of radiology, medicine, and cardiology at Emory University and bioengineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. So please welcome Dr. Rodney Predator <laughs> Uh, thank you, Bill, and welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully you had a, an enjoyable lunch and you got to take in some of the beautiful scenery as well. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to chair this session on the state of the science in research on mobile health technologies. We all are aware of the tremendous opportunities that mobile and wireless technologies offer to advance and improve health care uh, in a variety of areas as we've already talked about, uh, from being able to diagnose disease or diseases earlier, to manage them, to be used as research tools, but uh, also to engage patients as participants in their whole own health uh, care uh, and health advancement process. The development of these types of technologies, uh, however, have outpaced the rigorous scientific evaluation that is needed to establish the utility of these techniques and technologies uh, and their overall value to the healthcare enterprise. So this session is intended to address uh, that uh, the deficit and also to encourage more research to uh, establish these new techniques in, in that regard in terms of their rigorously evaluated and demonstrated scientifically based utility. So uh, the session that we'll have this afternoon will focus on clinical outcomes research. Uh, we'll hear from uh, two, if not three, uh, investigators in this area. Uh, so Bill is telling me that it's now two. Uh, Dr. Gustafsson, uh, who was slated to be the third panelist in this session, was uh, unfortunately um, not able to make it consequent to a flight cancellation. Uh, but we will focus on these challenges and also uh, the extent to which it is available, progress that's been made uh, in this area. Uh, before we have our two panelists come up and give uh, their presentations, and this will be followed then by an, a uh, period of open discussion, I'd like to begin by demonstrating an example of an emerging technology that uses, at least in part and in a significant way, a mobile uh, component mobile health component and illustrate the kind of research that I think is indeed needed in order to establish these new tools, uh, both in terms of what they really are good for, whether or not they do what, what uh, we hope they will do, uh, but how they really fit in into the overall diagnostic and therapeutic uh, process. Uh, this comes from the group at Mass General Hospital. This is a work of um, Weisler and his colleagues. And it has been previously described as the world's smallest uh, NMR. Uh, the scale that you see there in terms of the sizes of the components uh, is, is accurate. Uh, to the far right, you see a smartphone. In the middle, there is this platform this is, that is a microfluidics-enabled um, chemistry lab, as I, th I think of it. And uh, some of the basics of an NMR process, and then that is inserted into this handheld magnet, which is a little larger than the smartphone, as you can see. Uh, 
the three components combine to be able to detect the presence of cancer cells in a fluid sample that is extracted by a skinny needle and it does so uh, by taking that fluid sample, placing it on this middle component, the part that I call a chemistry lab on a chip, uh, and with the utilization of the microfluidic channels, eight of them in fact, containing eight different reagents specific for molecular markers uh, of cancer, identify the presence of these markers by an alteration in the NMR signal consequent to these reagents carrying along with them small components of a ferromagnetic uh, material. And the signal is then detected by the magnet and system that you see on the left. Uh, but the detected signal is received by and analyzed by the smartphone. And you see the smartphone on the right. And that decaying exponential curve is actually a measure of one of the fundamental parameters involved in NMR process, the so-called T2 signal. It is measured and it is quantified in the quantification of the signal, a uh, decay curve, that is how long it takes, uh, gives an indication as to whether or not the molecular uh, marker was present in the sample that's placed on that component in the middle. In plain speak, whether or not you have a positive test for a specific marker of cancer. So neat idea, but does it work? And the investigators first evaluated this with a, a set of patients known to have cancer, 20 of them to be exact, and use this to actually calibrate the signal, determine which of the eight molecular markers, those are shown in this uh, graphic to the bottom, uh, did the best job in identifying the presence of cancer and, and making that accurate determination. And they determined that a combination of four of those, so four of those are the four highlighted in blue, mucin-1, EGRF, HER2, and EPCAM, or the specific molecular markers for cancer, which uh, in, composite, in a composite fashion formed an index uh, that uh, did the best job in identifying the presence of cancer in this uh, sample that was used to calibrate the system. After the system had been calibrated and this was determined, then they sought to evaluate this in patients who were suspected of having cancer but not known to have this, or at least that was his question. And a prospective study was done to evaluate how accurate it is in making that determination. So this was then done in a series of 50 patients. This was written up in Science Translational Medicine. You see the reference in the bottom right-hand part of the slide. And the long story short is in this a case of 50 patients who came in who were unknown as to whether or not they had cancer, but had masses in their uh, solid tumors in their abdomen, underwent evaluation with this process and evaluation with the conventional process, which is open biopsy, taking a biopsy sample, sending it to the PATH lab laboratory, staining it and going through the various uh, immunohistologic examinations that pathologists do now uh, and making a final determination after two days. What happened is what you see shown here in red just under the title Game Changing Technology. And that is that this new handheld mobile enabled device, the DMR device, diagnostic MR is what this stands for had an accuracy that was over 10 percentage points higher than the accuracy of the conventional gold standard, 
which was biopsy. And it did so in 60 minutes, whereas the conventional biopsy result comes back uh, in two days. Now, you might ask, how could it be better than the gold standard? Well, the real gold standard is whether or not the patient uh, declares him or, or herself as having cancer based on long-term follow-up. And that was the point of reference. So based on that long-term follow-up and the development or non-development of cancer, these two approaches were compared head to head. And this new smartphone-enabled technology was a, was a superior technology. And this is an example of the type of rigorous evaluation that we need in order to establish the real value and place for these emerging tools that are mobile and wirelessly based. So with that uh, as an introduction, uh, I now have the pleasure of uh, introducing our panelists. And we will have two of them, that's correct, Bill. So our panelists are Dr. Bonnie Spring and Dr. Joseph Cafazo. Uh, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly, Joe. <laughs> Dr. Spring is a professor of preventive medicine, psychology and psychiatry and behavioral sciences, and she is director of the Center for Behavior and Health at Northwestern University. Northwestern is a hub for technology-supported interventions to improve chronic disease and risk behaviors. Her own research focuses on interventions to promote healthful lifestyle change, including the development and testing of treatments that incorporate emerging technologies. And we'll hear from her shortly. Dr. Joseph Cafazo, who some of you have may seen uh, by way of his TED talk uh, available on the internet, is assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy Management and Evaluation uh, and the Institute of Biomaterials, and he's also a biomedical engineer at the University of Toronto. He is a lead for the Center for Global eHealth Innovation, uh, which is devoted to the evaluation and design of healthcare technology. His research involves the use of uh, new and emerging technologies for the management of chronic diseases, such as diabetes, asthma, end stage renal disease, and congestive heart failure. So please walk, welcome to the podium. Dr. S Joseph is going first. Okay, Dr. Cafazo. Thanks, everyone. I'm assuming my slides will come up. it'll be a minute. <laughs> the next one. Next one. Great. <laughs> Perfect. All right, thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about how we use research to develop better apps, what we believe to be better apps. And we use this notion of um, user-centered design, except it's informed by clinical research. So we call it research-informed design. And if you're familiar with user-centered design, you'll see some of the feedback loops that you're, you're often associated with user-centered design. So we start off with ideation and concept. We go th through a design phase. We build the app. And we evaluate it, but we don't evaluate it in the sense of a trial at this point. This is where we're using 
uh, aspects such as usability testing, heuristic evaluations, what you would normally do in a user-centered design process. Moving on from that, we talk about what health services researchers like to call is, is the evidence-based research, which is uh, pilots and, and inevitably the randomized control trial. So just focusing in on this evaluation aspect, which we believe to be fundamentally important, we're very fortunate to have a team of 20 human factors engineers and designers at the center that they do evaluation of technology every day, including the systems that we develop. So they're evaluating it based on heuristic principles or the higher level of evidence is you know, we're very fortunate to have a usability facility embedded in Toronto General Hospital where we can bring patients and physicians and nurses in order to get all the bugs out, make sure that the, our, all our assumptions on design are proper, are validated before we go into the randomized control trial. So we do do pilots, and I love doing pilots. This is the least favorite part I have. How, how's that for putting it? The, the part of the whole process that I like the least is this evidence base part, largely because of that dreaded RCT. It's not that we don't do RCTs, we do lots of RCTs. We've, we've completed three RCTs in the last few years. In fact, my colleague, Dr. Logan, will be presenting tomorrow on our diabetes during pregnancy trial. We have an RCT in asthma underway we, we just got funding to start an adolescent type 1 trial in February 2013, but these are the reasons why I hate doing RCTs. And there's lots of them. I could have gone on to the second page. Um, they're enormously expensive. Uh, we spend at least three times as much money doing research trials, the randomized control trial, than building the apps themselves. An app is not a drug. There's too many confounders, there's too many variables. You can't compare oranges to apples. They take years to do properly. The app is obsolete by the time you publish. And that, this next one, I resent the fact that funding agencies are much more willing to fund an RCT than in cre the creation of the app. It really bugs me. They're quantitative in the end. RCTs can tell us what, but they can rarely tell us why, and that's why I love qualitative research and pilots, because that's really where we can inform the design of apps. And then there's this, this stuff that drives me crazy. Do people familiar with this RCT on telemonitoring heart failure? It got a lot of attention, because it was a well-performed RCT. It was multi-center. It was a telemonitoring intervention, and it came down to the conclusion that there's no benefit to this technology, and that all those previous studies were a waste of time because they were underpowered and they weren't properly randomized, et cetera. They criticized the previous technology. But do people remember what the intervention was? There's no real analysis or commentary on the intervention in this, in this paper. And I don't know why the New England Journal of Medicine let it go, but the intervention, and, and this was the consequences, right? This, because this was such a significant journal, it got a lot of play. People were questioning whether or not any of this stuff is, is useful. Forbes magazine picked up on it. But the intervention was an IVR system, right? These, heart failure, these frail heart failure patients were expected to go in and dial in their blood pressure value every day, their weight, answer questions. It was the antithesis of user-centered design. It was the antithesis of being patient-centric. They had an enormous attrition rate, but there was no commentary on that. It was just black and white. This stuff doesn't work. And it was ignoring all the good research that was done through the Cochrane collaboration, right? The meta-analysis that actually showed that you know, looking over the years of this technology, effective in reducing the risk of all-cause all mortality. Our motivation is this, in doing this, is that I'm a hospital-based researcher at Toronto General. We have to deal with chronic illness. This consumes about 60% of all our spending, just these six chronic illnesses. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research that we've done. So the first one, with my colleague, Dr. Logan, who'll be, again, presenting tomorrow, but this is the RCT that we did on di diabetic hypertension. So a blood pressure monitor uh, communicating with a BlackBerry 
And this is what we did. We took the control group just had a conventional blood pressure monitor. The, inter the intervention group had a Bluetooth-enabled blood pressure monitor that communicated with the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry had reminders, a reminder system. It communicated uh, back to the patient on concerns about their blood pressure readings uh, through trends and communicated back to the family doctor as necessary, not every single reading, only as necessary. And this is what we found. So after a year, no change in the intervention, in the control group, the, the, just the blood pressure monitoring. And the group that had the BlackBerry-based system saw significant decreases in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Now this is significant because it was over a one-year period, and this translates to about a 20% drop in cardiovascular mortality, so pretty impressive results. And the other thing is that there was no burden on those family doctors. We looked at the, uh, the follow-up in terms of what these physicians were doing, and there was no real significant changes in the management. No additional medications, no additional visits. It's about the same. So we can speculate on what the um, mechanism is, because it's an RCT. We didn't have a lot of qualitative data, but we believe that this is accountability and self-awareness, that these patients were regularly taking their measurements. They got phone calls often if they stopped taking their measurements, whereas the, the control group who just had the blood pressure monitor, they were not engaged. They were likely not engaged, and that, that blood pressure monitor ended up in a drawer somewhere. The interesting thing is, though, years earlier, we had already published pilot results on a 30-patient non-controlled trial. And if you look at the results, they were about the same. About a 10-millimeter mercury drop in systolic, about a 4-millimeter mercury drop in diastolic. Now, look at this. Pilot results published in 2007. Five years later, we, did the, we ended up getting the RCT done. Why? Because, you know, we published the pilot results. You have to raise money to get the RCT. You've got to recruit and so on long time to do RCT, but we essentially knew back in 2007 that this technology was working. Another example, kids with diabetes. This is a, we, we like hard problems. So adolescents, and we were modest this time, what we want to do is simply a pilot to see whether or not we could get them to test more frequently. Right? If we can get them to test more frequently, maybe they'll become more self-aware, be more cognizant of their blood sugars. You know, this is the technology they use today, but what we did is created an app called BANT, and we wanted to experiment with BANT. Let's see if my video comes up. I probably could have predicted that. <laughs> anyway. BANT uses um, a Bluetooth-enabled glucometer, which we designed. It was basically a conventional glucometer that, that communicates over Bluetooth. It uses uh, social media. It uses gamification. Some of the gamification that we tried out was simply giving them rewards for taking individual readings, bonus points for taking multiple readings, and so on. And we, uh, they, they were able to accumulate these points and redeem them for iTunes redemption code, and we gave out hundreds of these, uh, these rewards over the course of our three-month pilot with only 20 kids in the pilot. And we saw this. They, they tested almost 50% more frequently. Now, we have the RCT coming up, but I'm betting that this actually works based on these modest results, right? And... Um, I have to thank you know journals like JMIR for being giving us a venue, and, and this is a little about a little self promotion because my colleague uh, runs the journal Medical and Internet Research. But there's a lot of a lot of uh, journals won't publish uh, a pilot of 20 kids over three months, right? So especially on a, on a, a mobile app, so it's important to get these results out. So I have lots of plans for for Bant. Um, you know, we published the pilot results. I think the RCT, if I really hurry, will get out in 2015. But honestly, we're learning things through small pilots and qualitative research that can inform better apps right now. And as an engineer, that's what I care about. I know that people in the, in the field care about that most, and RCTs have their value. And you know what, quite honestly, I'll still be doing RCTs in 2015 and 2016. I know I will be. But in 2015, 
we want to see BANT further along than it is now. I have a group uh, who's working on a type 2 version of BANT that is, is de-emphasizing blood sugar measurements and emphasizing activity monitoring and, and, and diet and so on. And then JDRF has graciously given us some funding to have BANT as an open platform for the artificial pancreas. There's so, much, so many other things we want to do. We, you know, we have a, a heart risk um, assessment app that we'd like to do, do more work on. Our asthma app has just entered a randomized control trial, but we want to move this along much further than, than simply RCTs will allow. In the end, I have not had one parent of these kids with diabetes come to me and say, can't wait for that RCT to be over so that I can get my hands on band. People don't think that way. This is, some of, it, of this is out of our hands that, that the consumer is demanding this now. And I'm not saying that we should abandon RCTs. Like I said, I'm a health services researcher as, as well. We'll do the RCTs, but we have to be a lot more nimble in terms of the research methods that we're using for the purposes of informing mobile health apps. Thank you very much. Testing. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Cafazo. For those people that are sitting in the middle, in the back of the room, and along the back wall, there are a few seats up here on the front to your left along the side if you can make your way, and then also some seats here on the right along the side, and a few up in the front. So our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Bonnie Spring. If we could have our slides, please. Um, I work in um, uh, M Health interventions uh, for diet, physical activity, and uh, obesity. And um, I'm going to give you some impressions of the state of the science and basically six takeaway points. Um, first is we have a whole lot of really shiny, cool new devices and apps and sensors um, that we can use in this area. Very exciting. Um, here are some of them. Um, we have um, uh, wireless scales that now mean patients can weigh themselves and their data uploaded to the cloud. Um, we have armbands that measure energy expenditure um, and report that back to patients and their coaches. We have um, sensors that uh, record someone's moderate vigorous physical activity and upload that in user-friendly form. Um, ways of recording um, uh, dietary intake and analyzing that to help people keep track of their calories. We have this um, a robot called Autom who will sit on your kitchen counter and be your weight loss coach. Um, and most recently, we have um, the tooth sensor, um, which is a really cool thing that at the moment detects bacteria in your breath. And um, most of us in this field are just hoping that this is going to be a way to directly analyze calorie and nutrient intake um, so you don't have to enter it and have it analyzed and wait all that time before you get the result. So we have all these technologies. Now, what is the evidence that they work? Um, and this, I've been for the last few days at a, a truly wonderful um, training institute in M Health that um, uh, Wendy Nielsen and the NIH run. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm actually quoting um, Wendy and, um, and Noam Ziv, who were at this conference, for making some very important points. Um, the key question to ask is, what do I mean by evidence? You might equally ask, what do I mean by it works? Well, if I'm an engineer or a designer, 
Um, what I mean by evidence is that um, the technology is liked by users. It meets the criteria for user sensor design. People are happy with it. They continue to use it. If I'm a computer scientist, I mean that uh, it has good functionality, it has few bugs. Um, if I'm a corporation, um, the evidence that it works is that it sells, it makes money for me. If I'm a venture capitalist, um, I mean that it, it works, it's giving me a return on my investment. Um, if I'm haptique, that is certifying apps, I mean that it has good operability and that privacy and security uh, concerns are addressed and that the content makes sense. But if I'm a scientist, which I am, um, I mean that it has evidence of efficacy and effectiveness, which means that it actually changes behavior and produces a health outcome as evidenced by a trial design, a research design that gives me confidence that I have controlled for errors in making that judgment. Um, and um, although I share Joe's impatience with the RCT, um, I also remember the results of the trials of hormone replacement, um, which uh, was, were trials about something that we knew worked to the point where we didn't think the RCT was needed, and yet we found something that we knew worked was actually killing women rather than helping them. So I sit someplace in um, this degree of um, impatience and nervousness that we really need to know if something works in terms of the evidence of efficacy and effectiveness. Um, uh, you might say, and I, you know, I, I tend to be intuitively inclined towards this belief, that if something has high user appeal, um, it's, and people are going to use it and like it and it sells, it probably is going to have efficacy. But I think we're starting to accumulate some evidence that that's not always the case. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a, a, an app called UbiFit that was developed by Sonny Consalvo at University of Washington and uh, co-owned uh, uh, co by Intel. Um, and it's a, just this really wonderful little app for monitoring your physical activity. As you see, you start out with no physical activity. Um, and then as you accumulate some more, your garden grows. It develops, grows these flowers. How reinforcing is that? And then as you... Um, as you've actually um, uh, met your goal, you get a big butterfly in the garden. Very appealing. It should work. It doesn't. Um, should doesn't. So I, I think we have to bear in mind that it's possible that an M Health intervention can be gorgeous, it can be beloved, it can be used. Um, and it can even be lucrative, but it can be ineffective or potentially even worse. Um, and this is actually another um, insight I, I gained at the M Health Summit. Um, this is an app that's um, marketed online. It's called Mel App. Um, costs a dollar ninety nine, and it exists to um, help you determine if you have a melanoma. So what you do is um, you take a photo of your mole and it's uploaded to the cloud and it gives you back some information, uh, it, it codes it based on its diameter and its um, evolution to tell you a risk that it's a melanoma. Now unlike the example that Dr. Pettigrew used, there is no RCT um, for this app, um, but it's sold, it's making money, and there are three possible outcomes that we think of when we talk about evidence-based practices. One possible outcome is that there can be benefit, and that's the hope with this app, that it will encourage people to take this result to their physician, and it might have that result. Or it might be inert, or as most interventions um, have, have an eye, insufficient evidence. But there's another possibility. Um, and we've become very sensitized to this possibility in evidence-based practice. It's the possibility that, that it could do harm. And that's possible um, if people felt confident in a result that was inaccurate and as a result didn't go to their physicians and get something like this checked out. So just to bear in mind that when we don't have evidence, we really don't know which of these is the case. Third insight. 
Widgets, the um, technology we, we develop, don't do magic. They offer a tool or a channel that lets us apply effective behavior change techniques. Even some fairly homey apps can be effective when they integrate valid um, behavior change techniques. And here I'll give you an example. This was one of the first mHealth interventions that we did. Um, you remember the, the green screen of the Palm Pilot? Um, well, there it was. And we were using this as a device to administer behavior change techniques to get people to increase their healthy eating and decrease their unhealthy activities. And we were applying these behavioral techniques. So we had people set goals. In this case, the person had to eat um, five fruits and vegetables a day, and they had to get um, an hour a day of uh, moderate, uh, vigorous physical activity. They self-monitored another very effective behavior change technique by entering their uh, food and activity into the palm. They got feedback because that information was converted into the, um, how they were doing on these um, lovely goal thermometers. Um, and um, we added incentives for them to meet their goals. We had them upload their data. Um, you remember hot syncing? Well, that's what we did, and you can imagine what this intervention was like to do. We had to do home visits sometimes to connect to the different computers um, that people had in their homes or uh, help them modem the data in. And at the end of the day, we sent the data um, to this um, nice, friendly coach who contacted them once a week by email or by phone just to give them some feedback on how they were doing and some advice. We were very frustrated with some obvious um, problems in this system. One of them was, although we had an objective way to measure physical activity with an accelerometer, um, we couldn't get that in real time yet. So the way we had people track their physical activity was they had to self-report it, and that's what they were self-regulating, even though we knew that that was wrong. Nonetheless, it worked incredibly well. Um, so what you see here is um, data from a condition where we were having people coach to increase their fruits and vegetables and cut down their TV watching, their screen time. And what you see is that they started at about one fruit and vegetable a day. During the period when we were coaching them, they went up to five and a half. Um, and then after we stopped coaching them and the intervention was over, six months later, they still were at three. They had tripled their fruit and vegetable intake. In terms of their screen time, they had started at about three and a half hours. Um, uh, at the end of the intervention, they'd cut it down to an hour and a half. And uh, six months later, they uh, were at two hours. So they had once again about cut it in half. We used a very similar, very homey, not very attractive technology in a weight loss trial. Um, and we did it with a, a very, uh, one of those populations where we had a lot of trepidation about whether they would be able to use the technology. It was elderly veterans um, who were being treated for obesity in the VA's um, MOVE program, which is basically group classes for weight loss. Um, everybody was enrolled in that treatment. The control group was getting just that treatment. The experimental group was getting that treatment plus our um, nifty Palm Pilot uploaded to a nice coach, and you can see that we tripled the weight loss. Now, both of these technologies, the one for changing diet and physical activity and the one for, for losing weight, are now have RCT evidence, and they're, um, so they're evidence-based. But notice, um, uh, it's 2012. When was the last time you saw a Palm Pilot? So this is, um, this is important. Now, actually, it was not all that hard to go from our clunky old technology to develop much spiffier new versions like those that you see here that we're now using, um, where um, we use um, traffic light colors to display. What you're seeing here is the diabetes prevention intervention displayed on a smartphone. Um, the, um, uh, showing how close somebody is to their calorie allowance and their fat gram allowance using traffic light colors to tell them whether they're in a safe zone, danger zone, or 
uh, should be worried. The green vertical bar is their physical activity, and now it's being Bluetoothed by this um, shimmer accelerometer. Um, now, where I need to move, and I'm moving there as fast as I can, and it's probably not fast enough, is we do need to use some of these new research designs, and there are now ones coming down the pike that, um, that let us optimize our M health interventions that don't have us go through the process of throwing out the kitchen sink, waiting five years to find out if it works, and then needing to do dismantling trials to get them lean and mean and figure out what was actually doing the work. If we'll use these engineering techniques, we'll optimize from the outset, keep the intervention lean and mean with only active ingredients, and tell more quickly um, whether these things work before the technology becomes obsolete. So that's where we need to go. We've been slow to get there, but that I think is a reasonable place for us to be aiming. Last um, uh, comment I'd, uh, I'd like to make is um, something that we haven't done particularly well at yet in terms of mobile health technologies, but I think is the wave of the future and very important, is that when we can catalyze them, social support is an intervention component that we know works really well. Social support, the kind of accountability that we create with our coach, who the patients know is, is monitoring. Um, they may not be talking to them more than just once a week or sending them an email, but the, the person knows somebody is paying attention. So there is both a support and an accountability. And I think this is probably a major reason why we have the kind of results we do. And social networks also. These, I think, can be quite powerful change agents. So here's what we do now um, to bring social support onto our mobile apps. This is the same diabetes prevention program, uh, weight loss intervention. What you see is we're treating people in groups of eight, and we're incentivizing them in a, in a group weight loss competition, which we do partly to give them an incentive, but also to motivate them to care about their teammates. Um, so we ask the question, what do you need to know about your teammate in order to know how they're doing and be motivated to encourage them? Well, our focus group data told us nobody wants their weight floating around in cyberspace. I don't care who you are, you just don't want that. But people were okay having their peers, their teammates, know if they were self-monitoring. And so that's what you're seeing here. Um, this, um, the icon in the middle is showing each team member's um, progress at logging in, at self-monitoring what, what they're eating. Starts out red in the morning before they've logged in anything, um, goes yellow when they've logged in a meal, goes green when they've logged in three. Um, on the right is the icon for whether they're wearing the accelerometer. Same thing, starts out red, goes yellow, goes green when they've worn it for the whole day. And this is both um, gives people information about what their teammates are doing so that they, they, they can be accountable to one another, and it's also reinforcing. You'll see um, this reference to, uh, okay, I'm in for the three-peat um, uh, flag feet. Um, people find it motivating to get those flags green, and sometimes the groups will compete to have multiple days when the whole board is green because they've all been adherent. So this is a sort of a simple way to get social support into a mobile app. The challenge with it is um, something we learned from larger social network interventions is that most people don't participate. Um, and so this can be the challenge. If you have only one person who's writing to the chat room, um, it can get to be a pretty lonely place. It can get to be actually aversive. So the direction we've been moving is to try to expand the social network. And here I'm showing you um, data from an online weight management community. This is actually Calorie King's data for two years. Um, we had 30,000 participants in the data set. Um, by the time we code it uh, to those who have two weight loss interventions, or two weight loss uh, weigh-ins, and, um, and f at least 50 days in the system, we're down to about 20,000. And what you're seeing at the top is um, the data for those 11% of people who use the social networking people feature. So it's 11%, that's pretty typical. Um, the color code is green, those who are green, and particularly darker green, lose the most weight. 
Um, and those folks are clustered in the giant component in the, in the middle, that six degrees of separation phenomenon. If you're in that giant component, your odds of losing weight and more weight are increased. And you see it down here on the bottom, where you can see that the average weight loss um, for everybody in the system, um, which is mostly those who are not networked, is about 2.5% of their body weight. If they have even one friend, if they're in those isolated clusters around the edges, um, they gain an additional percent. They, they lose about 3.5%. If they're connected to the giant component, they lose about 4.5%. And then there are the real active ingredients in this site. There are these people called connector hubs. They're only about 1 to 1.5% of those people in the site. And these are the people who not just have a lot of friends, but are connected to different communities that otherwise would not be connected to one another. If you're connected to one of those, your weight gain or your weight loss goes up to more than 6%. And here on the right, you see the dose-response relationship between the number of connector hubs you're linked to and the magnitude of your weight loss. Um, if you're linked to one of them, you've got 4% weight loss. By the time that you get up to six, you can go up, up to an average of 14%. So this is the, in, the indigenous therapist. Um, this is the lay therapist who is in this social support network doing the natural work that those of us who develop coaching interventions are trying to do. If we can figure out how to engage and catalyze these folks, um, I, I think we've really got something that we could harness through M Health. So I'm just going to recap my um, conclusions. I think we've got all kinds of new, cool um, M Health devices, but um, the problem is um, even these very cool devices could be ineffective or even worse. Um, we do need to evaluate them. Widgets don't do magic. Um, they are a channel, they're a tool to engage effective behavior change principles. When you do that, even very homely apps can do some pretty wonderful things. Um, we can do better. We can now use new research designs that will let us optimize and evaluate mHealth interventions before the technology gets outdated. Um, and I think um, we need to push this envelope of harnessing the social network so that it can help us do some of the, the work that consumer health needs to do to, to promote wellness. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spring and Dr. Cofazo. We have a few minutes for questions, uh, five minutes to be exact. We have two microphones in the center for those who are interested in asking questions. Uh, as we have one questioner making her way to the microphone, I will, uh, if there are others, uh, we may have time for one or two more questions. Um, I had a question to ask, but since we have two questioners already, I will defer to the lady in front, if you could identify yourself, please, so we know who we're talking with. Okay, well, Willow Pequenot, NIH. And I enjoyed your presentations uh, very much. And uh, Joel, I agree with you, RCTs take a long time. And that's one thing that argues against them. And I do believe qualitative work can be extremely informative about why people are doing certain things and what the meaning is to them. Uh, but I have other issues with the RCT. One is the ethical issue. I think as we um, have effective interventions, it makes it harder and harder, I think, to do uh, an RCT where there's a distinction between the control group and the treatment. And the other one is at NIH, we get our money to benefit public health and I think a lot of questions to do with public health, the research questions don't lend themselves to the RCT uh, constraints. For example, random assignment. And I think in health, the issue is the patient is always going to be making choices. 
their own choices about the kind of treatment they want. And if you randomize people, then you lose that ability to investigate uh, what, their, what their choices are. So I, I would just, I would be interested in what kinds of questions you run into where the RCT just was uh, not appropriate and you couldn't answer the questions. But before I leave, I always have my Fitbit with me. I never leave home without it. And I can tell you, I wouldn't walk up the escalators here if I didn't have it. I, ha I have mine too, Willa. I, I'm not sure this is an app for Fitbit. It's, it's okay. There's others that are out there as well. Um, so uh, this, this is a classical uh, evaluation problem in e-health in general. It's going on for many years. Is that the, the trouble with the fact that you, it's difficult, you, you, can't, you can't blind people to the intervention um, there's a lots of confounding variables. Um, you're not never comparing the same thing twice, right? And and I, I believe RCTs were really built to protect the public against, as you were saying, harm. Much of what we're doing in M Health um, has the potential to do harm, but much of it does not. And and I think it's really a question of the rigor that we need in terms of evidence to show small behavior changes and so on. There's opportunity cost if, in fact, we waste a lot of time on an intervention that we expect a behavioral change that is not doing that. But um, I think that's a, a moral question in terms of what method you're using in, in order to ensure um, someone is not actually going to be harmed. And I, I agree with you that um, uh, an application that is supposedly diagnosing a melanoma, well, that's something that uh, it's beyond an opportunity cost. That can definitely do harm. But many of the things that we're talking about is, is, is small behavior changes in, in something like an adolescent, which is a difficult problem to solve. Two um, quick comments. One is, um, in terms of RCTs, it's also possible to do comparative effectiveness trials where you truly are at equipoise about which treatment works better. So everybody is getting at what you think is a quite plausible active treatment. Um, and the other is, I've completely forgotten the second point. Never mind. <laughs> okay, uh, can we have the second questioner, please? Hi, it's Gary Welch at Bay State Medical Center in Western Massachusetts. Uh, my question, um, I've, I'm a health services researcher, uh, and I run a behavioral medicine research group, and I've been in study sections in the NIH as well as I'm the guy putting the grant in. <clears throat> and I've noticed that with the mHealth type of uh, remote home monitoring, uh, pilots we put in, we get dinged a lot. And usually the, the committees, and I was on the same types of committees, and you often have people who are brought together to look at a bunch of grants, and we're told, you know, we know you don't have expertise, just do the best you can. This will be a, a common wisdom. We'll figure out the good stuff. But what we're finding is that we get a message that this stuff has already been done, or the data is already there, so it's not, hasn't got the impact. And so it's really a, just a, a fit between the committees and the people who are in the front line who know the data isn't there, that know these systems have not been brought into the clinic, and, and they're trying to sort of figure it out and get funded, and the hospital or the institution's looking for the grants. So there's a sort of a tension here, and you're almost as if you should be looking for other types of funding because it's not going to work in an NIH, AAR, RTPQ type of setting. So I just wonder if you could comment about that. And the other uh, related point is, the sort of the standard RCT designs, uh, and particularly at pilots, what sort of ways can we approach these uh, these sort of designs so that they're acceptable to committees? So they look at them and say, that looks like something we'll fund. Almost as if we have to sort of give some templates so we can drive the field a bit faster. Well, the, the second one is is a little easier for me to, to address, and it's um, in part there are publications being done, some of them. Uh, by NIH authors arguing, introducing these designs to people and, and um, you know, arguing their validity. Um, there's been a fair amount of work going around introducing these designs at professional conferences and so forth. So I think that's, I think that just needs to happen. Um, I think it's, um, I think you raise a really good point um, in terms of, um, this tension between the study sections wanting really cutting-edge novelty and then saying it's already been done. Um, 
And I think that's um, one of the, I think there's two kinds of novelty that we want. One is really technological novelty, um, but the other is it's a really terrible place to be when we have evidence that people think shows something works, but the truth is it hasn't been out evaluated yet. We don't want to be in either one of those situations. I don't know what the solution is. But Joe, you may. Um, usually the, the issues that I'm faced is that um, a review committee actually does, doesn't think that the intervention is credible, right? Especially the, the engineering technology ones, they, they don't believe you should even bother creating, how can a mobile health app uh, have an improved health outcome? Like it's that level of cynicism. So you have to get past that um, and, at, and, and then they're looking for um, either you've done pilot data or if, if you haven't done pilot data, you should be doing pilot data before uh, you are considered for a randomized control trial. Um, you know, I don't have any magic bullets in terms of suggestions of, of how to approach it. It really is on a case-by-case -case basis with, with respect to each granting agencies. And we've had better luck with those smaller research foundations, those private research foundations that are willing to take a risk. So BANT was funded out of a small uh, research uh, grant from St. Elizabeth Healthcare in Canada. This RCT for, um, for BANT is being funded through uh, the Thrasher Foundation. Um, you know, it's the, if, if I went to Canada's equivalent of NIH, the CIHR, um, I would ask for 100,000, they would give me 80, um, and we probably wouldn't be able to do the trial and that kind of uh, that, even if they would accept it in the first place. It's just, it's not there, it's not in their wheelhouse. The, the traditional granting agencies in this in this area. Yeah, we, we were funded by McKesson Foundation, so we sort of. So I, I think probably at this venue, just clarifying those avenues yeah. would be helpful. Uh, just one small comment before we take the last question, um, and I do have approval to continue to go on for a couple of more minutes, even though we're over time now. But this is an important session. Uh, I, I would agree with Joe in terms of your own question about uh, challenges of getting your grant funded uh, federally, is that each grant uh, has to be reviewed and considered uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. The NIH uh, is uh, very much so a merit-based uh, system. Uh, that is the, the core of the NIH review process. Uh, I can appreciate that there can be challenges as you point out, but perhaps those are best addressed early on, even before you submit your application, by a conversation with a program director to the specific uh, entity that you're going to submit your application to. So the final question, please, from Wendy. <coughs> Wendy Nelson, National Institute of Health. Um, I just, we're at, we're at the M Health Summit. We know there's a large industry presence here. Can you, can you speak to the, some of the benefits and challenges that working with industry to improve the evidence can base can make? I know both of you have been leading in this area, so. Um, well, I have to say that um, there are some companies that do get this, right? Um, WellDocs RCT was very helpful. And, you know, they're the ones who are walking and chewing gum at the same time, in all honesty. So they went off and they did an RCT. At the same time, they're uh, de developing their model further, and now they have some uh, business traction as well. Um, some other companies, most other companies, just totally ignore the evidence. Let's let's be frank. Um, uh, there there has to be a balance, and I and, and I'm saying the level of rigor um, is is such that I think RCTs are are needed. These companies need to do pilots. They need to show that their model works. Uh, they need to provide evidence. Um, I, I just don't think it's getting through because a lot of them are venture capital funded and the windows of opportunity are 18 months and two years. There's just no way they could do clinical trials. And as I said, clinical trials are hugely expensive. So if they get their app built, that's one thing. But to raise money in order to do a clinical trial, that's almost impossible. So there's a bit of a paradox there. 
I would, would say also, I think that industry is a reasonable place to look to support technical innovation. Um, it may not be as reasonable a place to look to, to fund RCTs, although you would hope that industry would want that kind of evidence for, for their technology. Okay, uh, and I can see some other hands are up, and I'm tempted to go to them, but we are over time, and I want to respect the, the schedule. Let me thank the panelists for their thoughtful presentations, the audience. I think it's clear that an hour was not quite enough, so maybe next year the organizers will take that into consideration.